Pat Project family, what's up? Have you guys ever been working out and maybe, maybe you got a calf cramp, hamstring cramp, or ab cramp? Well, that's probably because you might be electrolyte deficient. That's why we've partnered with Element Electrolytes, because most of the time when that happens, you're like, oh, I need to drink a lot of water, but you actually need to replenish your electrolytes. And Element comes in these easy to use packets that have a thousand milligrams of sodium, 200 milligrams of potassium, and 60 milligrams of magnesium. Pour it into some water, drink it up, and trust me, you're not gonna be suffering cramps anymore in the gym, when you're out, whatever you're doing, you're going to be well hydrated. Andrew, can you tell the people how to get it? Yes, you guys got to head over to drinklmnt.com slash power project. Uh, we highly recommend that you get a value bundle because you're going to get four boxes for the price of three. Get any four flavors that you want, but you're only going to pay for three of them. That's again at drinklmnt.com slash power project. Links to them down in the YouTube description as well as the podcast show notes. Head over there right now. It's beanie weather, huh? It is beanie weather. <laughs> what is that heater you, you said you got for the studio? Oh, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> like, where's the heater man he's like i'm actually never that cold so i keep not bringing it in all right cold so therapy I i'll made, text andy maybe she'll bring it in i made, I made another mistake so the, you know part of the reason why i've been cold is because i just haven't gotten a lot of sleep um, i didn't get a lot of sleep last night because the matrix came out did you stay up to watch it yeah so we thought about that but i'm like no i'm not i'm gonna be a zombie tomorrow like oh, i no know way. i know I, I thought i i thought i could you know weather the storm and i'm not a zombie right now mm -hmm. but when you don't get enough sleep you tend to feel colder when you sh like in cold huh. at least i know that for myself when i get a good amount of sleep cold um i'm resilient yeah. strong but when I don't get enough sleep, I'm like, I'm a pussy. Like, I'm huh. just like, I, haven't really I was huddled in the corner that. next to the heater in the office. <laughs> I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm always like, you know, waking up in the middle of the night and I'm fucking always cold. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, not in bed, but like outside, you know, like I just, I've always been cold. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. What about your eight sleep? Eight sleep definitely helps. Uh, so. They warm that bitch up. Thankfully, I, I usually like have left it at like level eight like plus eight to wake me up i cranked that bitch all oh the way wow up to, i cranked it all the way up to 10 and that that will get me the fuck out of bed oh my goodness it's pretty awesome yeah so it's weird i see seen wim hoff talk about like putting your hands in ice you know to help mm -hmm. cure like literally cure people of having severely cold hands mm -hmm. they do it for two three minutes and you do some doses of it here and there you, supposedly you get better and you said like, andy's hands are criminally cold yeah right? <laughs> yeah <laughs> Yeah, I'm like, are you still alive? What's going on over there? Um, but I wonder, like, could you just do it with the whole body? Because, like, I've been on runs before, and it actually feels really good to just not have, like, just to take a shirt off and, you know, be out there, and it's, like, 30 degrees. You're right. I, you're think if it's, I think if it's cold, cold, like, if it's, like, East Coast cold, then you might be in... He might be in some trouble if it's like zero, but what's East Coast cold though, by the way? Zero, yeah, fucking five degrees, negative, yeah. single digits, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but <laughs> black ice, like they got, oh, yeah, like, yeah, yeah, the ice on the road that you can't like see, mm -hmm. but it has like just the perfect amount of like powder over it, like a uh, little bit of snow on top, oh, and you mind. just end up in the fucking bushes, <laughs> and you're like, what the fuck? I wouldn't survive out there, dude. Me neither. A friend of mine from Missouri said that, um, Missouri. yeah, yeah, said that, like people died by icicles oh, yeah. out there yeah. oh. like that's a thing is that a thing in it'll New York? like hit them yeah you know? like icicles yeah. will fall oh. down from shit and like you got to like look up sometimes especially during that. winter weather you got to look up and make sure there's no icicles on shit just get hit right on the head by a so, big giant icicle is that a thing does that happen in new york or <laughs> climate change my man i don't know <laughs> uh know. east coast it doesn't i mean like where i'm at where i was where i grew up it wasn't that cold but if you go up further north to like Buffalo or you get near like Maine and then you're in Canada, mm. it's cold. My dad took me to uh, my dad took me to Niagara Falls when I was a kid and it was frozen. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Just like a little stream trickling down. Uh -huh. And I remember we were like, like, is that possible for that water to be frozen? That's coming down so mm -hmm. like ferociously, you know, but it was frozen. So I've been frozen like twice, and the one time my dad took me, I was frozen. Mm. That's crazy. You know, when I was a kid, I'm, I'm so like, I'm, I'm, when you said Niagara Falls, I remember this uh, time when I was a kid, and some kid was trying to say Niagara Falls. Oh, no. Same thing with the oh. country Niger. Oh, no. <laughs> it's like, we, okay, he <laughs> should have started. But like, yeah, like some, some kid was like, <laughs> I'm not going to say it, but he said it wrong. I was like, 
Let's say that right. Like, hold on. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but also, you got to spell it out for bruh, <laughs> Sound it out. There is Nigeria, and then there's also the country Niger. Spelled mm. N I G. I'm not saying Niger, one yeah. of them. <laughs> <laughs> it's bad, man. It's like when people get tripped, I'm just like, no. That is, like, that's not that is definitely not the country of. Yeah, mm. gotta, be, gotta be careful out there. Cool, we got today's guest coming on in. Here we go. Yeah, talk about the, that ketosis. Mm -hmm. Get on that level. It, why is he so jacked? Whoa, though? that is cool. He's coming with a stringer. He's coming with the oh smoke. My gosh, he's, he's got smoke in the background, he's got element going. <laughs> Hello, guys. How are you? Doing well. We're doing great. We're actually sipping on some element right here, right now. Same here. Oh, it's not it. Well, mm -hmm. yeah. Great way <laughs> to can't see it. You guys got some new flavors coming our way, or what's going on over there? Uh, likely in about uh, next year. Um, we're playing with some seasonal flavors. So maybe, I'm not sure, we'll see some uh, cucumber, like a mojito. Or mm. things like that. Wow. That's and good. likely also bring back a grapefruit, which was a huge hit. Mm. How did this how did this whole thing get started with uh you guys um creating this electrolyte brand? So you want the the romantic version or the real version? I love romance. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, and the the romantic version is very much what you can read on the website. Um it, it basically started with an interview with Rob about, what, six, seven years ago, I think. So he was trying to do keto again, uh, but he was not really, you're not hearing me? No, we can hear you. Okay. We're just adjusting so was, our sound a little bit. Okay, no worries. So he was uh, trying to get into keto again, but he was not very sustainable with uh, jujitsu, right? So um, I was, okay, let's review your diet, what you're doing, uh, what's your sodium intake? And um, along with other things that I suggested, he was like, no, you know, sodium, I think that I salt my food way too much. Uh, I probably don't need it. I don't want to go, you know, to the high pressure area, blah, blah, blah. And it's like, no, 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 Rob, if you're doing keto, you need more sodium, not less. And it's like, what the, yeah, you're right. It's like, because we are usually told, you know, it's one of those myths that, you know, you, you get told so much that you actually don't double check. Yeah. That's very much what happened to him. And it's like, you know, I tried uh, the salt shot before training and I could very much go on for hours, just like uh, when I was doing a high carb diet. Mm -hmm. So it's like, let's try it. And that's uh, very much one of the first uh, iterations. But the actual, actual uh, place where Element was born is uh, it's a recipe that we've been doing for well, I myself have been doing it for since I started keto over 20 years ago Whoa. that I started adding it to my clients when they felt <laughs> very much dragging ass, especially when they were training. Uh, I was just ask, uh, actually looking. I have, I think, the, the first recipe about uh, when I first uh, published the blog spot and uh, started uh, dabbling in Reddit was probably in 2007, 2006, something like that. And... Um, in a trip, uh, Rob came to Mexico, to Laredo, to Baja California. And he was here and said, hey, do you want to come over for vacations? It's like, I didn't really have anything to do. I went there with my, my now wife. And while we were there, I was, hey, Rob, I have this recipe. Have you tried it? Is there a way we can make it in the States? Uh, because I was trying to make it here in Mexico. Uh, it wasn't really advancing much. You're getting someone to produce it, et cetera, et cetera. It's so like, yeah, let's talk to a few guys and see what happens. And that's what happened very much. Hmm. Do you like when we started or when I started taking element, because I do low carb dieting with training, it's the thing that made the absolute difference. Cause like, well, I do jujitsu also um, and I, I weight lift and I was noticing that I was cramping up in the gym and that was like, it was kind of problematic. I was like, okay, maybe it's the diet. But once I started adding electrolytes in, it was literally night and day. It's like, wow. Okay. So I really don't need to have heavy amounts of carbs before I lift. Like that was the thing that made the biggest difference. Um, so is that the one thing that people, most people are typically missing when it comes to doing a low carb or a keto diet, as far as performance is concerned? It's, it's one, one is, is of course electrolytes and it's usually a little bit more than people think again, because we have all of these ideas that sodium is bad. Mm -hmm. Uh, but again, even if you're not doing keto, 
Uh, we know that salt, and we're probably going to see, start seeing this in more supplements. Sodium per se, along with a little bit of potassium, is very much what it's uh, what gives uh, your cells energy, especially when you're training at high intensity levels, right? Yeah. And of course, carbs do have a place, depending on um, where you are the spectrum of either health or performance. Like, uh, of course, you're going to need more carbs. There are some uh, types of training that are inherently glycolated. Mm -hmm. So, for example, if you're doing, going to be doing lots of sprinting, like uh, in certain uh, aspects of CrossFit, for example, right? Or in Jiu-Jitsu, like in Jiu-Jitsu, depending if you are playing defensive, okay, maybe not so much, mm -hmm. or just, just like rolling sporadically. But if you're doing, you know, that the chokers, uh, jumping, th that type of explosive movements where you roll over and, and go on top of the, the, your opponent, especially if that person is uh, like a, at a high strength level or bigger than you, mm -hmm. you're going to need that a lot of explosive uh, movement. Without carbs, you're probably not going to really uh, feel it. And it's something that I found out myself. <laughs> uh, I really haven't shared this anecdote, but I was just remembering when was the first time that I actually noticed that I needed carbs for explosive movements. And it was at a wedding when I was dancing. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. And I, was, I wanted to be a little bit more explosive and do you know, more uh, rapid movements. And I felt I was dragging. And yeah, it was because I was very much, of course, a little bit dehydrated but also it was uh, glycogen depleted. You can do, you can be strong without glycogen to a point, but you don't have that explosive movement. Mm. I think you just needed more carbs from alcohol. That would have probably done the trick. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. Tell me of about course. the uh, keto gains community, you know, for the people that are listening, uh, I'd love for them to know like what has made you guys different. And, you know, once somebody really like starts to dive into keto and they start to look around, and they stumble upon some of the things that are in the keto gains community, it is different. It's not the same as all the other uh, keto diets. So maybe you can explain some of that to us. For sure. So uh, keto gains, the, the main difference is that we are not um, like a, <laughs> the butter chuggers crowd from, from traditional <laughs> keto for, for once, right? A second that we follow and focus a lot more on nutrient density and also in a way, we are protein pushers, right? Uh, like some people say, we're not really keto, we're really more so low carb. I really don't care what you call us, as long as you follow the protocol and understand, right? Because uh, a lot of people think that keto is just because uh, that's what they've heard or read, or even if they're nutritionists, that's what studies say. It's a high fat diet, moderate to low protein, and super low on carbs. And they all go by the classic uh, ratios, right? 70% fat, 20% or lower protein, uh, and then the 5% carbs or less. And if you only um, use or follow keto in that closed, uh, with that close idea, then you're always going to see everything with the same lens. And how I learned keto or how I uh, modified it is, basically understanding, and this is actually now even published in some studies. What you need to enter ketosis is basically a sufficiently low amount of carbohydrates. You need to empty your uh, liver glycogen. That's it. And you don't even have to empty it at zero because it's really actually not possible. You're, it's when you get to that special threshold that depends on the individual. So it's like maybe 20, 30% of your living glycogen is full of carbs. That's when your body sees the need to produce ketones because very much it's a response to a stimulus. It says, okay, probably there's not enough energy in the environment. So let's start to use our own energy source, which are fat, right? And then from that self uh, fat burning, you get the byproduct, which are the ketones. So if you understand that thing or that main difference, which is the same, but looking at it with a different lens, then you know that hey, I don't have to eat all the fat, right? I have to eat just enough fat depending first on my goals, my activity levels. And it's very much like Dr. Ned Tayman says, if you are high fat, if your body is high fat, maybe all you need is a low carb to a point. Again, I'm not saying zero fat. It's just maybe not as high fat as you probably eat or think because or when you want to lo lower a little bit your, your body fat, right? And then carbs, they come and go depending 
on your metabolic flexibility, uh, what type of sport you're doing, what's your current goal at the moment. You want performance, okay, maybe you're going to have to add more carbs. You're just training maybe in the off season or training recreationally. Maybe you don't need that as many carbs as you think. Now, as far as keto is concerned, what, what else do you think is the rest of the keto community or people that are hopping on keto? You mentioned things like fat bombs, like they're doing a lot of those. What other things are you guys doing very differently or talking about very differently as far as keto is concerned that are typically normal keto practices for people outside of the keto gains community? So, uh, first of all, we are in the, in the camp that calories do matter and the calories do count. But uh, whether you count calories or not also depends on, again, your objectives, right? Mm -hmm. For a lot of people, we, when you have a very specific goal, calorie counting can be, or a macro counting, which is more so what we suggest. It's a tool to make sure you are on track and you're heading in the right direction. It's very much like, hey, you're using uh, Google Maps or Waze. You know you're going to get there, yeah. right? Uh, versus just you know, uh, driving north and hoping you get there, probably you're going to get there eventually, probably by chance, probably you're driving south without knowing, right? And that, that's a lot of the things that we've seen uh, with people, especially with other communities or people who follow keto differently. A lot of them get results, but suddenly they stall. And also they chase just weight versus understanding the difference between body composition. Mm. A lot of people lose weight very rapidly, but at the expense of also losing a lot of uh, lean mass. So you end up just being a smaller version of yourself. You're still uh, in a way with the same body fat or skinny fat, right? Yeah, you, you look better with clothes, but you take your shirt off and you say, hey, I lost 20 pounds or 30 or even 100, but I still don't have abs. What happening? Well, the thing is that along with that fat that you lost, maybe you lost me uh, also a big amount of muscle. What we do is teach people the importance of uh, training, of also eating adequate protein, not lowering protein as uh, some community suggests. Yeah. So that, yeah, maybe you're going to lose less weight, but it's because you're also maintaining or even gaining muscle at the same process. Uh, do you find it helpful to not be like dogmatic and uh, to maybe not always lock yourself in? Like sometimes somebody does keto and they're like, I'm keto. I can't eat any carbs because I want to get bumped out and so on. But in your opinion, could you have some days that are a little bit more keto-ish and have some other days that maybe aren't and you're just kind of modulating maybe the amount of fat that you're consuming? So on certain days, maybe you pull back the fat a little bit eat a little bit more carbohydrate and you kind of go back and forth between the two, or is that a recipe for disaster? It, it depends on a lot of factors. Uh, when we coach people, we also look not only at their physique, but also where their head is at, right? Uh, in some cases, it can create a bad habit. I'm a firm believer of first tackling the habits rather than just putting people on a deficit or adding you know, difficult things to do. When you have people doing, for example, cheat meals or, you know, uh, carb loads, etc. First, I found over the years that carb loads are seldom necessary. If you're a bodybuilder, of course, you're, you're going to have to do a lot of the stuff that it's traditionally suggested. But there's uh, like a, a lot of uh, traditional bodybuilding stuff got communicated to the recreational athlete crowd or people that just want to lose weight. And it doesn't function the same for them, right? Mm -hmm. Like, let's say... Imagine, um, I don't know, uh, a lady that's 100 uh, pounds overweight and she reads that carb loads he help uh, move a little bit more fluid or help you with a stall. And she starts doing carb loads. She has no place doing carb loads, but we see people like that all the time, right? Whereas if you are maybe 12% body fat and you're finding it difficult to probably uh, drop that maybe two extra points, maybe a carb load can help you move that a uh, little bit of the extra intracellular water and glycogen and also increase a little bit your need and your metabolism and then drop down. Those are tricks that you can use, but when you are fairly at the advanced stage or at the end of the cut, not something that people that are just, again, recreationally dieting or mm. training should be doing. Of course, again, and this is something that I say to all my clients, if you want to eat that donut, that is the best donut in your time, go and eat it. But 
go sit, enjoy that donut for what it is, but really enjoy it, savor it. And that's it. And you go back immediately to the to the diet that you were doing. And don't see it as a diet. See it more as a way of life or, or something that you actually do and enjoy. If you are dieting and it makes you feel miserable, let's find either another diet or let's learn to cope with other things, right? And it's very different to eat that donut that it's actually a good donut in a way that it's something you enjoy versus going to a 7-Eleven and buy that greasy donut or seven, which some people do just for the sake of having a donut, right? Mm. You know, on the side of performance, you're talking about really advanced athletes. And a lot of people that listen to the show are athletes that are trying to get really strong powerlifters mm -hmm. or individuals that are really trying to gain as much muscle as possible. I can truly say that, I mean, when I was focusing, like when muscle gain was the main thing I was trying to focus on, um, I was doing an IFYM kind of high carb diet. Um, I got up to 270 pounds at a certain point back in 2015. Uh, and that's how I built a majority of my muscle through the years. Now I'm low carb. I'm still actually slowly building muscle, even though my main goal in the gym isn't purely muscle, like muscle building focused. Um, it's more performance focused, but I'm still able to build muscle on low carb. Now, my question here is like guys that are new, right? Um, or people that are new to building muscle, bodybuilding, strength training. Can they build as much as somebody who is doing a high carb diet, but they just need the correct structure as far as like the correct structure as far as protein and fat and low to no carbohydrates? Can they still in their building phase when they're building a majority of their muscle, is it beneficial for them if they want to take on that diet or is it more beneficial to do a more traditional, I don't even want to call it a bodybuilding, but you know, a high carb, high carbohydrate diet, good amount of protein, moderate to low fat diet, and then later on make that transition. In my experience, and maybe I'm an outlier, but I've been doing this for 20 years. Mm -hmm. You can definitely build a great physique and a great amount of raw power on a keto gains style diet, which is fairly familiar if you, I don't know if you guys are familiar with uh, lean gains. Yeah. Okay. I've have heard. you read the, or the, the, the actual book? I haven't read the book, no. Okay. Uh, there's a version of lean gains that a lot of people think or that they know. And there's a version of the book written by Martin on the book. Uh, when I read the book about two years ago, it was like, hell, this is keto gains. Because basically what he does to build muscle is go much higher in protein, maybe about 40% of your calories, 40 to 50% of your calories. And this is for lean gaining, meaning you gain uh, muscle in a very lean way. You stay, you are going to be staying between 12 to 14% body fat, which is basically when you can still see your abs. So it's like, uh, again, 40, 50% protein, then about uh, you end up eating 50, 60 grams of carbs, depending on the training intensity. And those carbs, mostly from green uh, vegetables, lots of nutrient dense, some fruit. And then the rest of your calories, basically from nutrient dense sources of fat. So basically the fat that comes along with the protein sources, egg yolks, uh, the fat that comes with the beef, uh, et cetera, right? Uh, maybe some cheese, et cetera, but it's high quality fat, not just butter for the sake of it, not just adding coconut oil for the sake of it. Yeah. It's like everything that's very nutritious. So it has a benefit of, even if you're high on calories, protein, as you know, is super highly thermogenic. Like you spoke uh, on, on, I've been following your podcast for quite a while. So very lo uh, know a lot of that, especially the ones related to training and nutrition. Uh, you had Alan, Alan Aragon a few um, cast be uh, before, and he basically said yeah, protein uh, is very much a free macro, right? You really cannot get fat on protein, but it's like, again, the, the best food for uh, building muscle. Mm -hmm. So it allows you to be super full. You get a higher thermogenic effect, which allows, again, it's inefficient in a way caloric wise, but it allows you to eat a lot more, feel satiated. And then along with the uh, extra carbs that you may add, uh, especially green veggies, but, and I'll go into this a little bit later, some extra carbs for performance. And then just the fat, which is also in a way anabolic you get mostly what you need for lean gaining. And um, I had some people always tell me that you'll gain more with, with uh, carbs. And yeah, probably to a point, 
but you have maybe also the risk of gaining a little bit more fat, right? And in my experience, when I've seen, uh, and also per some studies, but also with clients, someone that's gaining muscle naturally with carbs on a traditional diet mm -hmm. versus someone that's doing it our way. Let's say that the person that's doing the traditional way probably gains eight uh, kilos I'm talking about a novice trainer over the span of probably 10, 12 months. Mm. The person that did it keto gain style would probably gain five or four. And then here you're saying, okay, that's very much double, right? But the person that they that probably gained that on a traditional diet, of those eight kilos, a lot of that is also fat. So probably 30, 40%. Once that person cuts, they will end up with about four or five kilos, which is very much the same. The difference is very minimal mm -hmm. with the benefit that the person that did keto gains basically eats about the same foods every, every day or all year long. So you don't go through bulk and cut diets, which again, depends on the person, what you prefer. You prefer to eat more food some of the time and probably enjoy some diversity. That's perfect. Then go with a traditional approach, but then you're going to have to cut, mm -hmm. right? If you're junk, probably that's not an issue. But if you're past your 30s or 40s, it gets harder to lose fat over, you know, as we age for various reasons, habits, uh, disponibility of food, or also, of course, uh, our body becomes a little bit more resistant to hormones, whatever you may, may want to call it, right? Mm -hmm. So I prefer the eat about the same foods approach. It's great for your habits. And in the end, because you don't have to cut, it's also great for, you know, psychologically, you're eating about the same things. And of course, you can have one deviation here or there, which I do suggest maybe, you know, like a diet break, but you can do it one weekend every three or four weeks, not, you know, all the time or one week. Again, it really, there are a few variations there. We're almost at World Carnivore Month. It's almost January. And uh, what are your, some of your thoughts on carnivore style diets? So it's a very easy diet to use. I suggest it for people that have maybe gastrointestinal problems, IBS or et cetera, because it's a very, well, it's very much a super elimination diet. It's like the next uh, step from keto, right? And it's very similar to what we do in the sense of not limiting protein to a point. The, um, I do think there's a little bit of misconceptions out there. And again, I love, love eating beef and meats and everything there. And I veer towards a little bit of carnivore, but I do suggest, and I think based on my nutrition background, that it's important to eat lots of green veggies. And just as amino acids and protein are the best sources you know, from animals, some vitamins and minerals, the best sources come from the vegetable kingdom, right? Mm -hmm. So mixing both of them, if, especially if you don't have any gut issues, inflammation issues, et cetera, it's the best way to go for, you know, like overall health. Now, again, if you're going through some inflammation issues, IBS, gut dysbiosis, et cetera, okay, probably you can go into carnivore, try it out and see how it happens. But I don't think that long-term, it may be the best diet. You've been mentioning um, veggies as a form of carbohydrates, you know, it's the main form of carbohydrates that a lot of people within the keto gains groups utilize. Um, what specific veggies do you guys like, do you, do you like uh, use or you think is super effective? So mostly uh, it's a combination or my suggestion for vegetables is both for satiety, mm -hmm. but also for micronutrient content, right? So green beans, uh, mostly everything that's green that grows above ground. Uh, all right. Very much, but again, green beans, uh, spinach, um, all types of uh, the, the from the family of zucchinis, right? Uh, uh, I don't know if you're familiar, but uh, I eat a lot of chayote, which is very much like a big zucchini found here in Mexico. Super high vitamin C, lots of fiber, lots of uh, vitamins and nutrients, but it's super low in calories. What's it called? Uh, so, uh, chayote. Chayote. Never heard of it. Okay. Yeah, it, it's it's again. Uh, it looks like a. <laughs> The unofficial name in keto games with my clients is called uh, Shrek Balls, <laughs> very much, because it very much looks like a ball sack. It's a green <laughs> ball sack, and it even has a little bit of thorns. <laughs> We're into it. So, I love it. You have, right. you have to find it. It's, it's, but uh, nutritionally, nutrition wise, it's awesome, right? Okay. And um, uh, already said green beans. Uh, you can even uh, add a little bit of carrot, etc. As much mm -hmm. as 
the nutrient dense. And of course, I'm a super fan of uh, berries, you know, a strawberry, blueberry is something that I try to eat on an almost daily basis. And uh, well, of course, avocado is also what some would call a superfood, right? Got it. What about sneaking in other stuff that's sweet? Is there any room for that? Like uh, dark chocolate or something? I've heard other of people course. talk about it before. Yeah, of course. Dark chocolate, again, is also a, like a side comment. My grandfather was a founder of one of Mexico's biggest chocolate mm. factories for a while. So it was Amazing. like the Willy Wonka kid. <laughs> I, <laughs> I was, uh, when I was a kid, I was overweight and that was one well, of the of reasons. Of course. <laughs> so, <laughs> Makes so sense. no, I'm a super fan of chocolate, but as you know, when you go into low carb or keto, your taste buds start to change, right? Mm -hmm. And then you start to favor and notice the benefit, not, not the benefits uh, nutritionally wise, which of course there are, but also in the type of, you start to notice the differences of the various uh, types of dark chocolate. And you start to know the good quality versus the superior quality or something that's not really as as great as it maybe it's touted out to be, right? So yeah, of course, you can always add some chocolate. You can always add, again, the berries, uh, even almond, uh, butter, whatever you like. But again, I'm a firm believer of you have goals. I'm going, I'm a super focused person. When, uh, when I have a goal, I'll try to not go that route, but there's always a space to add, you know, every, uh, stuff like that. You said focus uh, there, and you said it very well. Tyler told me to ask you to say focus for us. <laughs> <laughs> we, we have a joke on that. Yeah, <laughs> like a anyway, um, what what uh, allowed you to kind of stumble upon a keto diet in the first place? Um, you did mention you were heavier as a kid. Like, what sort of led you down that road? So it's a story that I just recently opened the, the real version about uh, three years ago, I think. Uh, so when I was a kid, I was overweight and that led me to try to study nutrition on my own and start actually start bodybuilding. Uh, my mother took me to a nutritionist and she was quite overweight, right? And I said in front of her, how are you going to teach me how to lose weight? <laughs> <laughs> it's like um you probably know the saying uh, how, old never, were, how old were you like 12 um, <laughs> yeah, i was a i was a very you know that, that wise guy uh, <laughs> so I'm, I'm a combination between a bookworm and one of those uh that really didn't shut my my mouth right <laughs> so it's like uh, you know never trust a, a fat chef well, <laughs> Skinny well, chef. On, on skinny the, on chef. the contrary, never yeah. trust a skinny chef, yeah, yeah, yeah. and you should also, well, not trust a fat a dietitian. No. <laughs> <or nutrition. laughs> Chefs cook good. <laughs> yeah. So, well, that started my interest in trying to learn things by myself, right? But um, just for reference, I'm 44 years old. So this was back in the 80s. We didn't have internet. We didn't have Google. We didn't have all of this. Uh, so I tried to research, and my the only thing that I had was very much a uh, at the Encyclopedia Britannica and things like that, <laughs> right? Um, and I and, and of course, uh, my biggest influence at the time for strength training was uh, Muscle, uh, what was the name of this magazine? Um, muscle and Fitness? Mu muscle and Fitness, very much. All I learned from nutrition and training at the time was Muscle and Fitness, looking at Ronnie Coleman, Arnold Schwarzenegger, uh, Franco Columbo, all of those were, uh, and of course, I, I have this guy here on my desk. He man, he -Man was a big influence for me. And I, I said, I want to be like, like that guy. What uh, uh, do Arnold uh, eat and what does he do? And uh, of course, one of my first uh, books, and I still have it here, is uh, Arnold's Encyclopedia to Bodybuilding, right? But then uh, I managed to lose some weight. And when I got into college, I was through a period of depression. College was super hard at the time I, I went to very much like a Mexican Ivy League college and peer pressure was killing me, right? Um, I ended up anorexic. So I ended up uh, weighing about 48 kilos, which is in pounds like 120. Yeah. Let's see. Like 115, I think, or something. Yeah, something like that. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm not a tall guy. Uh, it, I'm uh, five foot six. So um, 
it basically I hit rock bottom, right? And um, I was studying business administration at the time, but uh, some friends were studying nutrition and I decided to go and join their classes. And that's when I started to get a more uh, depth in a sense of what, what macros are, how you can manipulate things for certain goals. And based on what I had learned from uh, bodybuilding and strength training. And at the time we finally had internet uh, I could go into the library and read and study. And, you know, um, I don't know if you're familiar, you remember bulletin boards from um, in those days. So I don't really recall which was the actual bulletin board that I was uh, reviewing, but I wanted to learn how the bodybuilders used to be jacked and cut while there were, uh, you know, pre contests and so. Basically, what they were doing was a version of keto. That's it. Right. They, they were very much like, a, you know, Palumba's diet, eggs and beef, pretty much, and some veggies. And um, I actually was in the same forums where Lyle McDonald was giving his advice just before he wrote the, the final edition for the ketogenic diet. So I was reading upon uh, Body Opus by Dan Duquesne, uh, The Anabolic Diet. Uh, things like that. I mean, again, they're all refinements of the same protocol, which means very much what we were talking all, all about, you know, a higher protein, just limit uh, starches, limit sugars, limit crap and processed foods, get your carbs from uh, healthy sources, mm. add maybe uh, carb load again from healthy sources, not just eat pizza and dogs and uh, a bread. Rather, when you do a carb load, you're going to be eating probably rice, sushi, healthy things as well, right? So I started trying the diet and I started to gain healthy weight uh, because I was coming through that period of anorexia. I also was afraid of gaining weight. I'll send you a picture later, but in that time, I was uh, I always joke when, I, when people ask me about it. I looked like a Mexican version of Michael Jackson because I had <laughs> uh, long hair, but you know, just here, I was pasty white because of the malnutrition. You could see my ribs. I look like, a, again, mm. you know, like a cross between a Calvin Klein model and Michael Jackson. You could see my ribs, but I didn't have abs. I had a gut. Mm. And I was the, the, the perfect definition of a, like a skeletal, skinny fat, whatever you may want to call it. But then when I transitioned to the other diet, I actually felt more focused. I could study better. I had the energy to train again. Uh, I gained or I regained a lot of my strength and, and weight back. People started to ask me what I was doing. Uh, girls started noticing me. I became the buff guy at uh, a college. People actually wanted to train with me and do what I was doing. They started asking me about things about nutrition and so on and so forth. And yeah, I started explaining what keto was. And I already knew what, what keto was, especially after reading Lyle McDonald's book, which goes much more in depth uh, about all the aspects of nutrition and science of keto and how you can manipulate it for the context of bodybuilding, not just for losing fat, mm. which is something funny because we're again finding all of these uh, versions of keto, which are more focused on body recomposition and they were written in 2000. Mm. We already had a book, but just people forget about it. Yeah. Yeah, I remember reading a lot of that stuff. Um, I got on board with keto stuff pretty early on, and uh, I remember reading it in magazines and in books and stuff, and it was like mesmerizing. I was like, "How could this be?" You know, the, the general population doesn't talk about this. Meanwhile, I was trying to lose weight by eating like cereal and stuff, and trying to like go lower fat. Uh, I knew about protein a little bit, but didn't have knowledge about you know. Um, I guess basically the principle of keto, which is to kind of like lower the carbohydrates and then eventually you get you can get to a point potentially where your body is feeding off of its own body fat and you're also producing ketones as kind of a form of energy. That's just some of the real basics of it. What is going on inside the body when you're, when you're trying to get yourself in this ketogenic state? So uh, 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 how I understand it, and I try to explain it to people, is that a uh, ketogenic diet is very much like uh, you have a car where you, or let's, let's look at it as a more hybrid car. You can use either fat, which would be uh, 
electricity as energy, or you can use gas, which would be the carbs. So very much depending on the food availability or what you normally eat, you either use one or the other, right? Nowadays, because of what we've, uh, where basically what it's produced, especially if you live in a first world country, a lot of foods are super high on carbs and that have added uh, fat for flavor. Mm -hmm. Normally, if you ate uh, whole foods, uh, the, the mixture of uh, carbohydrates and fats are very different. But again, nowadays we are, because of the environment, the food environment, most food are super high in carbo carbohydrates and we tend to eat every two or three hours. So what keto does basically is first, it shifts the way our body functions. It makes you use more fat because you are taking away the carbohydrates or reducing them. It allows you to use your own stored energy as fuel which is also cleaner in a way. You are less infl inflamed. It, it creates less uh, reactive oxygen, oxygen species. So again, it's cleaner in a way to say. And uh, it gives you that also extra energy in the sense of these ketones have a uh, benefit for some people because uh, it's not universal that create an anorexigenic environment. And, I, and this is in a good sense. What it means is that it takes away hunger. And hunger is, for most people, the number one reason why a diet fails, right? If you are constantly hungry and thinking about food, which is something that happens when you just diet down and try to eat healthy carbs, or what are masked as healthy carbs, which, like you said, Mark, uh, cereal, right? eat cereal, eat a candy bar or a Quest bar or a protein bar or whatever. Okay, you probably, just by sheer willpower, some people can do it, but most people cannot. So you stay hungry and ravishing uh, for two or three hours and all you think is food. If you're on keto, very much like with fasting, you can go out on without eating for 16, 80 hour, 18 hours. And basically you just eat because you maybe remember that you have to eat, right? Not because you are driven to eat. Yeah, I know you're enjoying this episode, but I have a question for you. Are you still dieting off of broccoli, chicken, and rice, and maybe tilapia if you want to spice things up? Well, it's 2021. We're past that. That's why we've partnered with Piedmontese Beef. Now, Piedmontese is an amazing company that has cuts of beef that are really high fat or cuts of beef that are low fat. So if you are dieting on a low fat diet, you don't need to resort to the weak bird of chicken. You can instead eat some beef, eat some steak, and still end up getting the results you're looking for. So, Andrew, can you tell the people how to get it? Yes, you guys got to head over to Piedmontese.com. That's P-I-E-D-M-O-N-T-E-S-E.com. At checkout, enter promo code POWERPROJECT for 25% off your entire order. And if your order is $150 or more, you get free two-day shipping. Links to them down in the description, as well as the podcast show notes. Let's get back to the podcast. Now, I'm, I, I kind of want to know... As far as like cooking and keto, um, are you an individual that cares a lot about the cooking oils and that type of stuff that you use? Because a lot of individuals, I think you cook in ghee sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, we've had people come onto the podcast and say, oh, it's not a big deal to use canola oil. It's not a big deal to do that. And then other people who are like, it's toxic. So being a high fat individual and doing a lot of cooking, do you have any suggestions for people as far as cooking is concerned? Or do you not think that's a big deal as far as the oils? So I am more so in the middle, in the sense that I'm uh, very practical. Mm -hmm. And my idea is if you can buy things that are, that are not going to affect your budget, always prefer the best quality. If buying high quality things means that you're going to sacrifice other uh, things that are tire A, mm -hmm. then use whatever you have at hand, right? For example, I have people, hey, I want to use uh, this supplement and buy ketone salts and whatever, you know? And, and it's like, okay, and maybe that costs you 100 or 120 or $200. And because you're buying this, you're not buying eggs and beef. <laughs> Don't buy this, stick to the eggs and beef. I myself use mostly um, uh, avocado oil, uh, olive oil, coconut oil, and ghee. That's it. Why? I, I, I do suggest to my clients to stick to those uh, kinds of uh, fats to, for cooking, mostly because what I suggest is like a Mediterranean style ketogenic diet. That's it. Okay. And, uh, and also another thing to, to consider is 
there's a lot of uh, studies that support that those uh, types of oils may cause inflammation, right? There may be others that say that it, they don't matter that much. <clears throat> well, if you can choose, always be there toward the thing that has benefits, right? Yeah. So that's that, that would be my response. How does uh, speaking multiple languages help with some of your business? Because I see a lot of your content is in Spanish. And uh, when I traveled, um, I noticed there was a lot of countries and a lot in a lot of different areas where not, not that people weren't in shape. They actually, a lot of people looked great, but uh, they weren't muscular. They're, I didn't see hardly anybody that looked like they lifted. And I was like, man, I wish I kind of knew some of this when I was younger because it would have been great to be able to speak a couple other languages. I bet I could, uh, I bet I could really help help and reach a lot more people. So have you found that you're able to reach a lot more people? I mean, you, you live in Mexico as well, right? No, it's a, it's a blessing. And it's something that I'm very grateful with my parents and, you know, trying to educate me to, or help keep me be this curious about stuff. I'm, in, in in a lot of ways, I'm self-taught in a lot of uh, things. So basically, my my English was learned from learn uh, reading comics. So oh. I can thank oh, Spider Man and watching He Man cartoons and GI awesome. Joe and all of that because that basically made me speak very well English. And then also the part of studying, reading nutrition, uh, uh, studies, etc. Books very much like what we have uh, been speaking about. Those were the ones that actually also made me understand very well uh, other factors, right? And then because I'm a nerd, I saw that there's a, I actually can read about uh, seven languages. So I, I can speak fluently German and, and English, of course. But from those, I can read uh, French. I can understand it. Uh, Italian as well. My confidence in uh, myself Dutch. just took a I feel down. like shit. <laughs> <laughs> I barely can figure no, out English, you know? <laughs> this is just to prove a point when people uh, say that if you do keto for long term, your brain's going to get fried. <laughs> I have no issues uh, with any of those. And I basically, that's why I say I'm a, I'm a, bit, a little bit of a language and science nerd. I've heard in Mexico, and I don't know if this is a rumor or not, but when you get a trainer, it's not uncommon to also maybe get some steroids as well, which happens here anyway in the United <laughs> States. But is that because it's not illegal there? Does does that so, is that a thing, or am I just hearing weird rumors? <laughs> no, no. The thing is, uh, it's it's funny, and I was uh, I wasn't even aware of this until about probably three years ago. Uh, so I, I, I've always been uh, going to a gym that's more, uh, well, let, let's call it, it's not like Planet Fitness, like a more high-end gym, right? So the type of trainers you get there, uh, it's like you have science, like using steroids and everything is wrong, very much like in the States. But now that I studied uh, nutrition here in Mexico as well, it's actually part of the curriculum depending on where you study. Wow. It's like, it's not like you take a, like a certification on the side. You can take it, but openly, like you said, they're not illegal. You can buy, you can go and buy testosterone over the country, uh, over the counter in most pharmacies without a uh, prescription. Why? Because it's not illegal. And so very much like you said, Mark, in some gyms, if you ask your trainer, do you have this or that? They can probably suggest. The thing is that, there are some that may be super cheap. And so, again, you don't know what you're getting. So you want to go and use the high quality, either the underground labs would actually be, uh, as far as I know, some of the best, if like they, they actually come from a factory or just can get uh, the actual medical grade, which are Pfizer, Bayern, et cetera, right? But those are quite expensive. Yeah, we, we can't really end the podcast at any point without talking about fasting and keto and fasting they end up coming in i just saw you had a recent post uh where you're talking about fasted training i think you did a whole article about it so how does fasting come into the mix when you do things with keto gains and also i mean i do quite a bit of my training fasted but i hear that you actually don't suggest that people do that so how do you suggest that people go about using fasting along with a ketogenic diet and then when it comes to training and fasting, how do you uh, suggest that they um, put that all together? Okay, so a little bit of context here. Uh, the reason why I don't suggest fasted training is mostly 
if you want to optimize muscle building, mm-hmm. right? Okay. That, that, that's the, the main caveat. If you want to maintain or gain as much muscle as you can while in the ketogenic diet also, uh, it's like th- there are already some ideas or things that make people think that a ketogenic diet is subpar for strength uh, or muscle building. And I can uh, pretty much accept some of those ideas, you know, reduced mTOR, uh, some of the metabolic pathways may be, uh, you know, not optimized. So then why add another extra factor? That's very much how I see it. And um, I work uh, with Menno Hanselmans and have a good friendship with a lot of uh, researchers on keto. It's like, it's funny, but um, I, I like to see myself like uh, the middleman in between high carb and ketogenic diets because uh, I have a good relationship with, uh, or I, I friendly relationship with Alan Aragon, uh, Lane Norton, et cetera. Some of the, they're not really anti-keto, they're anti a stupid keto in a way. <laughs> mm-hmm. And uh, what I found it again, it's not that it's bad. It, it requires context. So what I suggest for people that want to optimize strength training is just to not train fasted. And what I mean fasted is more than four or six hours after your protein feeding. Right. And for those that train first thing in the morning, it's as easy as probably taking a protein shake before training or worst case scenario after training, right? Uh, what's the main reason? A lot of the things that people promote from the benefits of fasting for muscle building are misunderstandments. They're not real. And uh, for example, the growth hormone thing, mm. that if you train faster, your growth hormone increases. Yeah, it increases, but then it decreases. So the result is very much the same. You don't really get a benefit of you're going to be building more muscle while training faster because of this. Second, uh, uh, this is also again a misnomer. Growth hormone in adult humans does not create uh, uh, muscle. It's very much what happens is uh, the growth hormone is used to transport uh, building blocks, which are in this case amino acids, to repurpose them to other organs or cells that need that have priority. And we forget that uh, muscle has the least priority in our body. Amino acids are not only for muscles, are also for enzymes, hormones, your organs, right? So of course you are, uh, your body needs them and we cannot store really amino acids in our body. There's no, no place where we store them. We only assimilate them as muscle. Mm-hmm. It's like um, the best example I can give you which uh, makes a lot of people understand is, okay, you're training to build muscle, right? It's very much like if you were building a house. What do you need when you're building a house? Okay, you need bricks and the workers. Okay, you have the workers, you tell them be there at 7 p.m. Perfect, they're here at 7 a.m. And they come, hey boss, where are the bricks? I don't have bricks, but you can take away this wall back here and use it to build the wall we need in front. Uh, okay, well, so <laughs> how's that gonna work to build a house, right? Mm-hmm. You're just shuffling things along. On the other hand, if you place a little bricks here, okay, they're gonna use the bricks and they're gonna help you build a bigger house. That's very much how I like to explain it. Now, on the other hand, there are people that say and support, and it's actually that I felt because I did uh, probably all month for about a year and a half. Mm-hmm. Sometimes when you train fasted, you feel more energetic, you feel stronger. uh, And then this gives people the idea that you're getting, uh, again, stronger and you're going to build more muscle. This is mostly the effect of um, uh, your hormones, mostly um, adrenaline and a higher cortisol, which again are not the best for muscle building is very much like the the fight or flee response. Mm -hmm. You have a higher adrenaline, but why? Because you're training faster. Your body, let's put it in in ways uh, our body can understand. Our body doesn't know that you're actually lifting weights to gain muscle. Your body thinks that it's a stimulus and that you're in danger for whatever reason, even you're happy about it. And that you're you're probably even there fighting a saber to tiger or maybe running away from a buffalo that's coming for you. I don't know. But again, yeah, you're going to do 
or you're, you're going to be able to do incredible amounts of um, feats of strength, but it's not going to be optimal for her muscle building, right? If you personally um, get like a little bit out of shape for yourself, you feel a little fatter, you feel flatter. What are two or three things that you implement uh, that you think are really effective that maybe there's not like a lot of science behind or whatever, but it's just things that you've gone to and they and they seem like they work. Is there any type of like cardio style workouts you do or CrossFit workouts or is there any manipulation of uh, the food? What 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 are your what's like a go to for you? I'm uh, because of my age now. <laughs> it's gonna sound funny. When I was younger, I would do lots of cardio and probably, you know, diet down and do more a PSMF style diet, etc. Now, uh, this is something that I found incredibly well during the pandemic, and it's been two years now. I've actually been leaner now and maintain a lower amount of body fat in these last two years by doing less. So it's review and optimize your stress levels. Learn when to say no. If you need to sleep, like I used to be anti-naps, and now maybe I take a nap every two days. If I'm tired, I take a nap, maybe 20 minutes, 30 minutes, because, you know, rest and sleep are super important. We forget that muscle grows when you're asleep or when you rest. And the same happens if you are under rested, your cortisol is higher and you probably are going to have a little bit higher um, difficulty losing fat to a point, right? So that's that's one thing. The other, it's funny, I used to be count your macros all the time. I haven't really counted macros since COVID, but I've implemented a little bit of things here and there. Normally, maybe I eat one avocado. If I feel that I'm, you know, a little bit fatter than I like, okay, I mean, when I eat half an avocado or maybe no avocados for most of the week and I'll save them for the weekends. Uh, that piece of chocolate that you mentioned, right, Mark? Okay. If I had that one every night, I'm going to skip it and maybe just save it for the weekends. Mm. I normally eat four eggs. Okay. I'm going to eat just three eggs. So I prefer high quality meat, reduce a little bit of certain fats or reduce the amount of food I'm eating. Maybe I normally fast for 16 hours. Maybe I'll fast for 18. Mm. But again, just try to keep more, uh, reduce the amount of food I'm eating. But again, cut out some of the foods that I know that are just energy and stay high on the protein and the nutrient dense vegetables or fruits. Wow. Okay. What's a, what's a protein sparing modified fast. I think that you guys uh, at keto gains are, are the guys that kind of push that to the forefront. How can somebody utilize that? Maybe what's the dangers of it as well. Okay, so the, the, the issue with that protein is pretty modified fast. And, and also, uh, this goes very well with what we've been uh, talking about. People think that fasting and keto are the optimal for fat loss. And yeah, they are. They are. I, I, I think that they're one of the best tools that you can have in your arsenal for losing fat without losing strength and looking great naked, very much. But the OG for fat loss and body recomposition is PSMF, protein spring modified fast. It's even better than the traditional fasting because when you fast, and we, we have been sort of talking about this, yeah, you, you can preserve muscle to a point, but you will still lose muscle. That's, that's a given. People say that, no, you will not lose muscle. Yeah, you will lose muscle, especially after 36 hours. There are some studies that actually show that with, uh, I think they did uh, the, Nitrogen tracing, I don't really recall. Tyler has more information on that. Uh, I, can, I can check it out uh, later and send you the studies. But the thing is that after 36 hours, because your body does need the amino acids for, again, hormones, enzymes, et cetera, they're gonna, it's going to take them from your muscles, right? So that's why the PSMF approach was not really developed by bodybuilders. It's actually a clinical approach to preserve as much lean mass as possible, especially during clinically... Uh, or necessary conditions. You have mm. a patient that's over, uh, that's bedridden. Uh, the loss of lean mass is super dangerous again because you need amino acids, right? So what it does in the sense of body recomposition or what you do is go super high on protein, around three kilos or three pounds. Yeah, about three, three grams per kilo you weight. Probably it's like normally where you end up. You stick to only green vegetables, 
which in the end for most people, this would be in between 30 to 40 grams per day. And then you go basically as low as you, you can in fats. But when I say as low as you can, you're basically going zero to 10 grams of fats. And then these fats come from mostly omega-3 fats. So basically the actual protocol, as if I recall correctly, as written in the, in the book by Alal McDonald, he has a protein spring modified book. It's uh, the fat that you get comes basically from fish oil. That's it. And some vegetables to help you get filled. Uh, the issue that I see with people who try or attempt this diet is that they are, really don't have good habits, right? So they think this is a crash diet. They think that in one week, they're going to be able to lose everything they wanted. And they also do it with shakes. If you do like, uh, uh, we've been sort of mentioning that when you eat a lot of protein, you don't get hungry, right? Or it has an increased thermogenic effect. This only works when it's actual whole food protein. If you only feed someone shakes, you're going to get extremely hungry because it's digested super fast. It increases a little bit of, uh, it has a higher insulin spike than just food, etc. So it makes the diet miserable. And then you also don't lose fat very rapidly. Even though you may burn a lot of fat of your own body fat, there are some people that do retain a lot of water. So maybe you don't see the big change in fat loss in one week. It only occurs after the third or fourth week, depending on if you can actually endure the diet because of the famous whoosh effect, right? And this is something that I've seen anecdotally on people that do it. What I suggest instead is, okay, you know the basics of the, the diet. Why don't you implement one or two days per week sandwich it in between your normal diet or what you're eating? So let's say that it's a very, you have a very busy day Instead of just fasting, dry fasting like some people do, maybe just do a PSMN fast. Maybe like eat a big salad, some grilled chicken, which is super low on fat. Um, aim for, again, it's going to be a lot of protein because if you're going to be doing it for one or two days, maybe you don't need to go as high as a three grams per kilo. Maybe you could just go to two. And that's enough to uh, pretty much lower your calories for the day in a very big margin, which in the end over the week, and if you stayed on the same calories or same foods that you were eating, it's going to help you shed fat faster without actually feeling like you're in a diet. Because if you actually go and review and count the calories, you can easily stay at 800 calories in one day like this. Imagine now uh, probably eating 200 grams of protein just for, for reference we're going to be at 800 grams, uh, sorry, at 800 calories, yeah. plus the veggies that, how many calories you want to add on veggies? Probably 100 without adding, of course, dressings and unnecessary fats. It's a very easy way to, yeah, get in between 800 to 1,000 calories, which is going to make you lose weight. Do you do any other type of long-term fast? Because you, you hear some people um, talk about long-term fast, like, 72 hours, 96 hour fast for other health benefits. Do you do anything like that? Or do you generally use like sometimes PSMF um, and just general intermittent daily fasting for your protocols? I myself just stick to traditional, uh, very much body recomposition protocols. Mm -hmm. I've done just for the sake of it, because I forgot to eat very much uh, as long as 36 but it's not something that I either recommend or endorse. Yeah. Unless, of course, you actually have a medical condition that requires it. I know that some people, it has sort of become like a passing right to do a 72-hour fast. And I ask them, why? What's the purpose? Like, okay, I want to clean my liver or, you know, lose some uh, octopic uh, body fat or whatever. Okay, do you actually have it? Like are you someone that used to be a chronic drinker and you may have some kind of cirrhosis or mm -hmm. uh, maybe liver damage, et cetera? No. Okay. Like it's not, I don't know. If you want to test yourself, go and do it. But uh, like, again, context, I always try to ask people why or what's the purpose you're trying to, to get from it. If you cannot actively say, say to me or explain me in your own words, the particular reason maybe you're just doing for the lulls right i don't know 
uh, I don't think it's going to be optimal. Do you think people that are in sports that are highly glycolytic, like individuals that do track or individuals that are do, do CrossFit, um, do you think that they could get away with doing keto? Because like uh, part of like you, when you're doing keto, you're not trying to, I guess you're not trying to just chase being in ketosis, but I guess you're trying to have just enough carbs so that you can perform at a high level. Like that's how I look at carbohydrates at this point. It's like, I need just enough so I can perform really well, and I don't need any more above that. I almost look at carbohydrates as a supplement. Um, do you think that athletes that do highly glycolytic sports can do that, or should they just have the carbs or have as much as whatever, as, as most of those athletes do? I think it very much depends on what your preferences are. Mm. I do think that, uh, for example, I, I have a, in one of our coaches is uh, one of, probably it's, it's between the third or the fourth uh, best crossfitter in Costa Rica, right? I know it's not a big co a country, but it, she ended up in the 20 worldwide last year. Mm -hmm. And uh, she uses this approach, right? Depending on how many sessions she's training for the day, she's going to eat more or less carbs depending on the season. But of course, when she's competing for the CrossFit games, she's going to be probably at a, a 150 grams of carbs. Why? Because or even more because she needs them to perform at that level. But she is not at 60, uh, 600 grams of carbs like some other people may be. Yeah. She rather go higher protein, just feeds the carbs very much. And, and you know, how I like to teach this is very much, and very much because I come from a business administration background. If you have heard uh, the type of uh, administration called JITS, which is just in time, uh, which is a little bit um, on managing warehouses. It's what do you prefer? Having a warehouse full of materials, which you don't know when you're going to be using or having a smaller warehouse and you get the new materials, you use them, it's empty and then you shuffle more materials. Mm -hmm. So this is very much how I see the carbs. It's a strategic use of carbs, very much like what, how you do it. You add more when you need more, if you're in off season, maybe you don't need more, or you're going to be training more explosive for that day. You're going to be adding more. Yeah. I myself, when I'm training explosive powerlifting, I add more carbs. If I'm going to be just doing traditional bodybuilding style, I don't need them as much as uh, most people think. And one thing that I found, which is uh, super important, I used to recommend uh, glucose or dextrose uh, before training, right? So it's like uh, my break, let's call it breakfast in a way. My, yeah, break the fast or pre-workout uh, choice is some whey, uh, coffee, mixing coffee. So it's very much like a cappuccino, as you want to call it that way. A little bit of element, sodium, especially the chocolate one that, that mixes perfectly with it. And depending on the intensity, either glucose or dextrose, which are basically the same, just liquid or, or solid. But now, in a, for a few months, I've been dabbling with um, glycerin. Oh, okay. so, yeah. So glycerin is a type of glucose, but it has the added benefit that it also volumizes the muscle cells. So it adds a little bit of extra hydration. So you get better pumps and you get better explosiveness. So I've been uh, sharing this with some of my clients that practice jujitsu and, and uh, CrossFit, and they've been feeling much better, probably because of the extra hydration mm -hmm. versus just taking glucose. And it's just depending on your training session in between 10 to maybe 20 grams of uh, this substance. And it mixes perfectly with the coffee because it's very much sweet. Is it a powder? Uh, you can get it in powder, but I prefer glycerol. You can buy it on Amazon right. or any outlet, yeah. but just check that it's the food grade because it's, uh, you can eat uh, the, the ones I've seen on Amazon US, they are used as an emulsifier for creams and lotions. So you get the food grade that's used on pastries and, mm. you know, uh, candies and such. Yeah. You can mix it perfectly on your coffee. It just adds that little sugary taste and it's great because it's very much absorbed immediately. So wow. you're going to, ingest it and mean between 15 20 minutes you're gonna feel the effect it's kind of a weird uh substance because it's uh like an alcohol isn't it or somewhere in between that or something glycerol it actually looks like gel it's uh, right right like, right, like, right, right yeah yeah 
But, but it's funny because a lot of old school pre-workout supplements have it. Yeah. Like there's a, you know, probably old school glycer pump. I remember that I used to take it. And it was precisely the idea that it's very much increases the volumization of your muscle cells because it helps you retain water. Very much like, in a way, creatine. Yeah. But this is from actual uh, glycerol, which again, it's one of the, the forms of energy, you know, in fatty acids. Yeah, athletes use it as well. Like endurance athletes, they have those little goo packs or whatever they are, and they squirt them, <laughs> squirt them right into their mouth, the goo packs. Hmm. Hey, now. <laughs> I'm going to add that in. That's, that's a pretty good idea. What you got over there, Andrew? Yeah, I'm curious. Uh, Luis, you, you had mentioned about like, you know, eating vegetables as long as you don't put like a lot of dressings or anything on it. But if you go to the store, almost every company now has a, a, a product and then on the front it says keto friendly. Um, w- what are your thoughts on stuff like that? Like, do you recommend your to your clients like, hey, like you can go with this brand, like this is okay to use, but avoid, you know, X, Y, and Z or anything like that? Um, the, the issue is that by adding a lot of uh, dressings, you may be adding 100, 200, depending on how you how ma- much you use to your salads, right? Mm-hmm. And this is one of the issues that I see, especially with women. Let's say that you have a, a female that's on 1,300 calories, right? Maybe she, her average, I calculate her calories, and maybe she, uh, her maintenance calories are 1,600, 1,500. I'm talking about my average clients. And then, okay, let's eat 1,200 calories for fat loss. It's just 200 calories. If you eat those 200 calories from uh, dressing, I'd rather have you eat 200 calories from extra chicken or more salmon, et cetera, because they aren't really going to be filling you up. You're just wasting calories. Mm -hmm. Again, I do most of my clients very much like manage them as they were small enterprises. And that's how I try to teach them. Or like, again, balance and checks from your bank account. Use these resources for things that are going to be more nutrient dense for once and also is going to make you feel fuller. It's totally different to eat 1,200 calories from a lots of chicken, salads, and stuff rather than having more processed food. And the issue with uh, some dressings, again, depending on what the dressing actually is, you could be adding lots of high calories that could be used elsewhere. I'm not saying that to not use them, more so to check and see if there's space for them. You can probably add a little bit of olive oil, but I see people that use olive oil like if it was, you know, like, I don't know, five five tablespoons, maybe half of it, one actually sort of tastes the same. And you can also use a lot of non-caloric dressings. Like I've seen a lot of them that are great. Um, I don't know if... uh, I suppose it's an American brand, but we get one here in Mexico that's made in the USA. I don't recall the brand right now, but it's like you can either get ketchup, barbecue sauce, uh, like Thousand Island, et cetera, et cetera, which are just a mix of actual glycerin. It's uh, very much like Framel Kitchen that are used non-GMO, non-weird ingredients, paleo approved in a way, but are very much five or 10 calories per per spoon. In deference to maybe using 120 or 200 calories per serving, right? Yeah. Is there any, uh, because I I remember when I discovered keto, I probably like six years ago now, um, instantly wanted to figure out how to get into ketosis right away. And so I discovered all these other products. Uh, Basically, they're just ketones that would guarantee that you get into ketosis within like an hour or two or whatever it was. Um, But are there any benefits to taking in exogenous ketones while on a ketogenic diet? So how I explain that is that, um, yeah, you, you get ketones in your system, but it's not the same because they are not your own ketones. You are putting ketones in your system. So yeah, you're probably gonna read or see higher ketone readings, but it, it, again, they're not your ketones. You're not producing them and you're, they're not from fat burning. So for energy, okay, they, they, they have a, a use. If you're using also a therapeutic ketosis for a special, um, I don't know, maybe you're going to treat cancer or a neurodegenerative disease and your protocol actually requ- requires you to have high ketones, they can, of course, help. Now, there's also like uh, some lines of thought in some sports that they are experimenting with using exogenous ketones for speed, performance, etc. 
Uh, I really don't know. It's uh, like we say, still being studied. There's some studies that show some improvement. There are others that really don't see any benefits from them. Mm -hmm. I don't think that the jury is still out. Uh, like a, there, there's a definitive answer. It's more so let's think, experiment and see what happens. But again, for the purpose of getting into ketosis faster, uh, I think that they are misleading. If what you want to go is actually going to fat burning zone, it's just stop eating carbs. If you want to accelerate it for what it's worth, because it's going to only accelerate it for maybe six hours, okay, do some cardio, do some weights, because what you want to do is um, empty a little bit your muscle glycogen and then by proxy empty your liver glycogen. And that's when you start uh, very much creating those ketones. And then uh, also, so when you tell somebody that you're going to do a ketogenic diet and it's a high fat, um, high saturated fat diet, uh, the whole thing about cholesterol comes, you know, roaring its face right at you. Um, first off, like, why are we so damn confused when it comes to cholesterol? Um, yeah, you know, you have people like on the carnivore side that will show their blood work and it'll be like, perfect. You know, my cholesterol is totally in check, in check. And then some vegans will even do the same thing. Like, so is my cholesterol. But yet when we talk about saturated fat, it's like, oh no, your cholesterol is going to go through the roof. You can't have whole eggs. What's the matter with you? Um, so is there anything new in regards to cholesterol that makes a little bit more sense about all of this? It's not my area of expertise, so I don't want to be quoted on this. Save that. There's a, I think that again, there's still a lot of things that we need to study. I've seen in my case and with a lot of clients that their cholesterol numbers improve, especially the ratios versus the diet they were using before. What I can tell you is that if you're doing a keto diet or a high fat diet, depending, of course, your cholesterol numbers are going to get higher. Why? Because you're ingesting naturally more fat. Mm. That's a given. Mm -hmm. Doesn't mean that it's necessarily bad to a point. I don't like to see on my clients higher numbers of uh, cholesterol, total cholesterol. If I see they're getting overly uh, over 300 or maybe, you know, getting past 260, I would review exactly what they're eating and probably limit some kinds of saturated fat. I don't like them to be eating lots of nuts, nuts of cheese. Probably if you're going to be eating saturated fat, okay, let's make it come from eggs and fish yeah. and some beef but I don't want you to be adding that fat just because, right? Let's go into more a Mediterranean style diet. Again, most of my clients have, the, when, when we review their ratios, they are near perfect in most cases. And very rarely do we have clients after they've done the protocol over 270. In some cases, also it depends on genetic factors. There are people that naturally have higher uh, tendency for, or, or yeah, have a tendency for having higher cholesterol numbers. And always we need context. How were your numbers before? Are they improving? Right? Because uh, if we just look at certain numbers and we see high or, or whatever, if we don't have something to compare them to, we're just having, you know, not complete information. And another thing that's important is uh, when you lose a lot of body fat, what happens with that fat? Of course, it's going to be deposited in, in or that, that process of losing fat is going to make your cholesterol higher, especially triglycerides. So it's a transition thing. Usually within six months, it should you should see some kind of improvement. As long as you're losing weight, you're going to have, in most cases, a higher cholesterol. Now, uh, the thing that I'm not so sure of is people that are quite active that are super low body fat or low body fat, the so-called uh, lean mass hyper responders that you probably heard about, that have a super high levels of cholesterol. Mm. What we found, um, when I say we we have a small think tank uh, between Rob Wolf, Ted Neyman, Marty Kendall, Tyler, and some other people that you know love to talk and review things uh, on keto, protein, etc is that these persons may have subclinical hypothyroidism. So what we do with these clients, and we've had some of them, is we increase carbs with them. So let's go, instead of staying at 30 grams of carbs, let's jump to 50, let's jump to 80, let's jump to 120. Again, healthy food, 
let's see that you're not overly saturating yourself with fat. Probably let's lower it to 80, 100, or maybe 60. And you know what happens? Their cholesterol drops. Mm. So I don't like to go into this sales route where, no, no, your ratios are perfect. Don't worry because what, what if that person gets a heart attack or gets something, I don't want to be responsible for that, right? So we have uh, a good amount of people that have a goal that, that watch and listen to the show. They have a goal of like, I want to lose 50 pounds. I want to lose a hundred pounds. And uh, we've seen them be successful. You know, they said, I joined Mark Bell on the uh, war on carbs and I haven't looked back since. And I've lost, you know, over a hundred pounds. Um, but as we all know, one of the hardest things is to lose the weight and keep it off. So when somebody reaches that, that, uh, that goal weight lost, um, what are some actionable things that they can do? So that way they make sure that they don't rebound, um, as far as coming off of a ketogenic diet or maybe modifying it. So, so that way they make sure they don't gain, you know, almost all of it or even more back. So first, uh, two myths. One myth is that when you drop keto, you regain all your weight back, right? How I explain one thing is when you start keto, most people lose in between 15, 20 pounds, right? Mm -hmm. This is because uh, the loss of glycogen and water. So how I explain this is we have actually, or let's look at ourselves as we have two, weight, two sets of weights. What uh, Mark weights on a high carb diet at the same body fat and what Mark weights on a low carb diet. And probably the difference is gonna be between 15, 20 pounds, right? Why? It's just the, the, the glycogen and the water that comes along with it. One gram of glycogen in your muscles is bound to about three grams of water. So how much do you weight, Mark? Uh, about 230. Okay, 230. So imagine, yeah, probably you, you, if you carved up, you probably gained like 20 pounds very easily. And when you, and that's very much, imagine someone that sort of weights the same, the, the more muscle you have, the more glycogen you're going to be able to carry. And thus, what happens is you start the diet, you're going to drop, or if you leave the diet, you're probably going to gain it back. So it's not like you're gaining a lot of weight. You're going to gain that weight back and more if you go back to eating like an asshole, right? Mm -hmm. So that's one thing. And the second is, People say that this diet is not sustainable and that you're going to gain it all back. The same happens with any diet. Go back and see how uh, the success rate of any diet whatsoever. And most people within two years, they end up uh, rebounding. It's not just keto, it's any diet. Mm -hmm. And then what's the reason? Because they only use the diet as a temporary fix versus actually changing habits. So it can be keto, it can be a vegan diet, it can be a carnivore diet, it can be just macro counting. The thing, and this is something that a lot of people hate me for this, but you don't have to see it as a diet. You have to see it as a lifestyle. So choose a diet that aligns more with your dietary preferences and learn to stick for that, or to, to stick to that way of eating 90% of the time. That way means that you will be able to lose that weight, that, that weight and maintain that loss. And even if you go and eat pizza, it's not going to make a dent because you have to make eating pizza, not an everyday thing. Mm -hmm. Probably it's a one special occasion thing. And uh, it's sad, but um, one thing that I always like to say to my clients is the same. Like we used to have your, the, your birthday cake on your birthday. And now we have birthday cake every single day as a dessert, right? You have it as a cupcake. It's a mini dessert cake, but maybe you have five or you have a whole jar of cookies or you have your, I don't know, like your fat bomb, whatever you call it. It's the same thing with different names or different flavors, et cetera. So we're just looking to fit, you can call it the sugar demon or the dessert demon or whatever. The issue is, save those for very special occasions. If you have it every day, it's not special anymore. Thank you so much for your time today. We really appreciate it. Where can people reach you, find out more information about you? So basically everything that's Keto Gains uh, in the web, is it's us. That's it. Uh, my personal Instagram is Dart Luigi, but that's mostly for things in Spanish. 
Tito Games is in English. And of course, uh, Element as well. You can also reach me there. Awesome. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Yo. Darth Luigi, first off, that's a funny ass mm -hmm. Instagram name. But that glycerol thing, that's a really cool. I did I never Same. I think you maybe you've mentioned that before, but mm -hmm. I've never mm -hmm. thought about using it. Yeah, I've used it in powerlifting competitions and stuff. I used it to like recomp, you know, to gain weight back for competition and things like that. Um I don't have like a ton of experience with it, so I don't know how powerful it is, but it's supposed to hydrate the cells really, really well. And it's used all the time by runners. I don't know why it's never caught on any further like in any other sports, but um, I, I've heard other keto people in the past mention it as well. And I think that's where I first saw it, where they were like, you can still kind of hydrate the cells with electrolytes. I didn't really know like all the different electrolytes. I just knew salt at the time and with uh, glycerol. So it's really interesting. And I do think it's an alcohol for some reason. Mm. I don't know why, but anyway, that's yeah, interesting. Yeah. Um, he has a he has a, a great approach too. I think to his diet, um, it's interesting in listening to these people uh, that have been in the keto space for a long time. I mean, all this stuff is uh, written in a book called The War on Carbs that I wrote <laughs> a long ass time ago. Um, I even even in the book, I wrote about utilizing carbohydrates as a supplement, utilizing them to your advantage. And to use them for performance enhancement. And I wrote a whole sec, whole, the book's very small, but I wrote a section on it uh, where it talked about, you know, getting your carbohydrates up to 50, 100, and so on, depending mm -hmm. on, depending on your goals, depending on what you were doing. But I thought he had a reasonable, sensible approach. Sound like he's uh, down for people to eat some vegetables and things like that to help keep you full. So sounds like he's got a great diet to me. Mm -hmm. His explanations are pretty great. There's two that I liked a lot. Number one, the two weights that you have. Mm -hmm. Because like quite literally, if I went back to my way of eating carbs, I wouldn't um I wouldn't necessarily gain a crazy amount of body fat if I kept my calories, but I'd end up being around maybe two fifty five. Um so it's like that's like it is crazy how much you would you would just be holding in terms of water weight mm -hmm. um and then the second thing i liked was the warehouse thing he had yeah. you know what i mean like making sure especially if you're a performance athlete mm -hmm. just make sure that you have enough carbs to perform at a high level in terms of what you're doing rather than what most athletes do is have excessive amounts of carbs but this is also why a lot of those athletes tend to hold a little bit more body fat mm -hmm. because they're eating more than they necessarily need to eat for the thing that they're about to do yeah that and then the uh the, the building a house analogy which I, I've heard similar, but I think he just said it the, the best, you know, like you got to have some bricks there for your little builders to build. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of what's been in the back of my head when I, I work out and then I have breakfast before I come here. Whereas before I would just fast through it. Mm. Uh, I, it, it just makes more sense to me. But although with everyone we've had on, you know, we've, the calories don't just reset at midnight. Like mm -hmm. I'm definitely still having something in there from the, na the night before, mm -hmm. but it just, I don't know. It makes a lot of sense, you know, even he, and, but he said it wasn't even like a lot. He's like, have a protein shake, yeah, you know, right. something small. Don't, you know, obviously don't go to like uh black bear. <laughs> mm -hmm. They said before or after. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, if, so that's, that's, that's one thing, you know, I'm he also said four hours, yeah. just, you know, up to four, you know, that's, mm -hmm. that's a long time. That's not like, For, <clears throat> I think people are thinking pre-work, you know, pre-workout mm -hmm. meal. They're thinking like they're eating it on the way to the gym, <laughs> right? Yeah. They're eating their rice cakes and Quest bar or whatever Ooh. in the car with their uh, pre-workout peanut shake butter or whatever. Yeah. yeah. Got a carb up. <clears throat> yeah. Very sensible stuff. Um, even even the fact that he's not promoting like people dump more oils on stuff i think that's kind of an older keto thing i think mm -hmm. i think in the past people thought that like the somehow the more fat that you would eat you would somehow trick your body into like burning excess mm -hmm. more fat and uh as far as tricks go for the human body <laughs> there's not really many of them mm -hmm. it's yeah. hard to trick it's hard to trick the body into stuff you know yeah. and that's what I see with like you know how I brought up some of the uh, keto friendly products or whatever it's like they just added like a little bit more oil to get the fat yeah. content up and it's like hey there's still like basically 50% carbs in here you know mm -hmm. <laughs> like yeah, this is weird. bullshit like at Costco and uh -huh. Target and those places like they have, they have a whole category of like keto stuff and you're like I didn't know that all is keto stuff and you look at it and you're like 
I don't know if that's keto. The carbs yeah. are high and the fat is high. <laughs> and <laughs> it's like <laughs> yeah, yeah. 300 calories per yeah. serving. And it's like, wait a second. <laughs> Here's something really interesting. And I think that we forget this and we lose sight of it. Hmm. There's nowhere in nature. There's not <laughs> any sort of food that is sweet and fat at the same time. Like it just, it, I, I got a food. <laughs> I'm gonna shut up. All right, go ahead. <laughs> There's a, uh, you know, the, it, even with like carbohydrate, carbohydrates. Not talking about okay. <laughs> even car, even carbohydrates and fat. You know, uh, you won't find those two together really, except for like in nuts and seeds, and that's about it. But like an apple is sweet, but it doesn't have any fat. Uh, steaks have fat, but they don't have any carbs, you know, and you keep going down the list. Yeah. You can think of every single food. There's weird, there's some stuff like avocados and things like that, that get a little bit, uh, off, but, uh, yeah, they don't have sugar in them. Didn't seem as a child. <laughs> <laughs> Man, I'm, I'm just, uh. That, that's that lack of sleep is kicking in right now. <laughs> He's all delirious. <laughs> I'm not delirious. It's like okay. if he has a beer. <laughs> oh, no, no, that's, that's way different. But yeah, yeah he does. Pants are off. Mm -hmm. Man, yeah, my mind is just, my mind just went to the gutter. Yep. <laughs> well, bacon can be sweet, right? Yes, it can. It, yeah, but it's made sweet, though. That's true. It's made they sweet. put honey on it. Got it. Okay, I'm like, <laughs> no, what? Yeah, no, you're right. You're right, you're right. Okay, okay. Man. But uh, What were you talking about? What food group were you talking about? <laughs> Is this something like that's more from Africa than anywhere else? Oh, well, I mean, you could say it originated. Yeah. <laughs> we all did. Yeah, we all did. Yeah, yeah the, the out of Africa. Period. I'm interested. Oh man, no man, my you mom. You guys think we're foods podcast. that you're eating? <laughs> <laughs> Must be that goat head you to be talking about. Goat brain. Hey man, goats, goats, some good shit. If you guys haven't tried, I goat, agree. Go give it a shot. Have you had any? I have. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I think you talked to me about that recently. Mm -hmm. good. Yeah. I have not. You should try it, man. This goat meat's good. I like goat milk too. Pretty good. Hmm. I haven't had goat milk. Oh, you never had it. Good. I haven't had goat milk. Goat, yeah. Nope. But Lewis was very reasonable. Like that's yeah, like uh, yeah. Lewis. We just had Thomas on. I don't think you guys have seen. Well, actually, the but, Thomas yeah. Lawyer episode's going to be out. But um, we had Thomas on too. It's like we're giving y'all a keto thing, getting y'all ready for next month, so that you have everything you need. Mm -hmm. So again, I don't think any of us have the belief that carbohydrates are necessarily necessarily bad. But a lot for a lot of times they can trigger people to eat more food or um, just overconsume calories, and it, it really doesn't matter the type of calories that you're overconsuming. I think in the long run it might because you know you can look at like habits. Like if you eat like a teriyaki chicken bowl mm -hmm. on a, on one day and it's slightly off plan, I think that's a lot different than eating like a big bowl of ice cream because it's when you eat the bowl of ice cream, you're probably going back to like an old habit. Yeah. Whereas the chicken teriyaki thing, even if you were to eat equal amount of calories in it, um, it's, uh, it's not ice cream and it's not going to probably trigger you into cheating on your meal the next, cheating on your diet the next day and so on. So I do think there's a little bit of play with some of that, but for the most part, uh, carbohydrates and fats together, it just makes it so much easier to eat more food. Mm -hmm. So highly processed foods are things that people, in my opinion, should do their best to really pay attention to and, and do the best to like just not have them in their diet and just yeah. not have them around. And I totally am. I'm totally convinced that I could have built all the same amount of muscle with a different type of diet. But the main reason I was going very high carbohydrate is I was trying to convince myself that this was for performance, but I was also trying to allow myself to fit in a lot of these processed foods, a lot of these mm -hmm. highly palatable foods in my diet, mm -hmm. count it and make it fit. But that also built bad habits, which made it very difficult to get lean. I think if you follow this approach to dieting, still implementing carbohydrates it doesn't need to be keto it could be low carb but still implementing carbohydrates you can still gain that muscle have better dietary practices and have better habits to make it easier when you get lean that was one thing that always kind of annoyed me about flexible dieting type stuff even though it can be tremendously effective i was always like well you're only counting and tracking because you're allowing yourself to eat shit that you're not supposed to eat in the first place yep However, that same thing happens with people that do keto as well. You're still eating, you know, you got to just got to be cautious when it comes to any processed foods, no matter what bar it is or what kind of, they can be great treats and they can be things that uh, satisfy some needs for that particular day, but be careful. Yes. 
Andrew, take us on out of here, buddy. Sure thing. Thank you, everybody, for checking out today's episode. Uh, please uh, like, comment, uh, comment anything that you learned today or anything that you're going to implement uh, down in the uh, comment section below. And please make sure you're subscribed if you're not subscribed already. Uh, follow the podcast at Mark Bell's Power Project on Instagram, at MB Power Project on TikTok and Twitter. My Instagram and Twitter is at I am Andrew Z. And I always forget, but like all of these links and everything will be down in the description below. And Seema, where can people find you? And Seema and Yang on Instagram and YouTube and Seema Yin Yang on TikTok and Twitter, Mark. At Mark Smelly Bell, strength is never weakness, weakness is never strength. Catch y'all later. Bye.